Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's Jan Carlos Koharik here, uh, Deputy Editor of the RIBA Journal and Editor of Products in Practice. Thank you very much for joining me on this Tuesday morning uh, at our latest PIT webinar series on office and workspace design. I was reminded recently by a uh, previous editor and colleague, Reba J. Editor Hugh Pierman, that the provenance of the word office came obviously came from New Fitzy Gallery in Florence, designed by Giorgio Vasari from 1580. And it might be a famous gallery now, but it was originally designed to be the administrative offices of the Florentine magistrates, just with works of art dotted at its ends of its great external corridor, connecting the Piazza della Signoria with the Arno River. Now, clearly such an amazing precedent set the bar high for modernism's response to a typology fueled by market capitalism. Louis Sullivan, Frank Lloyd Wright and Mies all paved the way for Hermann Herzberger's Central Beher, Willis Faber, Lloyds of London. But post-pandemic, how will the nature of the office work adapt to new realities? How does it respond to the increased demand for remote working and a more balanced work lifestyle? Will the intervention of technology, smart cities, or Carlos Moreno's 15 minute city? With vast swathes of our capital's commercial estate remaining empty, and office spaces being hastily converted to residential and or new uses such as schools, and armed with our own laptops and the internet, do we actually really need offices at all? It's kind of a big question, and perhaps not one I'm going to demand of my speakers today, although they may well have a, a take on it. But everyone presenting today is in some way responding to the enormity of these challenges in their everyday lives as architects. And it's a pleasure for me to welcome them all to today's Offices and Workplace seminar. Our opening speaker today is Claire Nash, Director of Claire Nash Architecture. Now, she's previously written a book um, on vernacular, but she's actually founded Claire Nash Arch Architecture in 2011 in Brackley, Northamptonshire, and specialises in rural architectural design, particularly eco refurbishment and new build. Her designs draw inspiration from vernacular, which is obviously the subject of the book that she wrote about originally. It's a small dedicated team which is pioneering in its adoption of flexible and efficient working models. And I understand from Claire just now that actually they've been remote working pre well before the pandemic. Eight years they've been remote working as a, as a practice. So I think it's interesting to see ultimately really how, you know, it was actually no change at all for them to carry on practicing even when the pandemic hit. She's an associate lecturer and a teacher of architectural business and a REBA studio examiner at Oxford Brooks. And she'll be talking to us today about her book, Design Your Life, An Architect's Guide to the Work-Life Balance, which is published by Reba Publishing, and which you can also get a 20% discount on if you actually go to, if you use the um, discount code, which I'll tell you in a moment. Um, so hopefully Claire's got some insights into how actually things that were forced on us actually don't necessarily need to be forced on us, but can actually be quite natural. So Claire, if you're there. Hello. <coughs> Hello. Good morning. So I'm, I'm going to talk about creating a healthy environment for your staff, which um, would apply <coughs> within a physical office or um, in a remote working situation like we have. Um, uh, it's not working right. <coughs> um, so this is some of our team. We've recently taken on three new people, so it's a bit different. And uh, we're taking new photos in a couple of weeks. So. Um, but I'm going to talk about uh, how to maintain a happy team when you're in a remote working environment and just in general, really. Uh, Work-life balance, a tricky thing for architects especially, and remote and flexible working. Um, so I, I think these are the four main things that make for a happy team um, at work. Trust, autonomy and fulfilling work and freedom. I didn't make up all of these by myself. Some of them came from research that Carol Newport did who I talk about quite a lot in my own book. Um, so trust, I think, is the number one thing. And 
the also the most often posed question about how do you keep an eye on your staff when they're remote working and I think to myself well um I wouldn't have employed them if I didn't trust them and I um I really enjoy um working with people who like the same um have the same share the same values and enjoy the same kind of projects that I do so if you're motivated already then you're going to be you know interested and motivated to work at home and um so it's more results-based um uh, model rather than sitting there and watching you like over the shoulder kind of model and um and I also think like, I've made an absolute ton of mistakes in my career so far and in some practices I was it was there was a bit of finger pointing and, and things and we all as humans feel innately awful when we make a mistake so I think it's quite key to be more solution focused and um, offer more support and that makes people feel good um and um yeah, and then autonomy, I think it's important to give people the freedom to attack the task as they want it, not be like, oh, have you done this? When are you doing that? And, um, you know, constant chasing, micromanaging stuff that doesn't give people the freedom to do, to be creative uh, as much as anything else. Um, and fulfilling work, I think I've, I've spoken a bit more about that anyway, but if, uh, you know, a lot of people will choose a practice based on the projects they want to work on. And so that's important to maintain that. So if we're going in a different direction, I involve all the team in choosing what kind of work they'd like to, to work on in the future. Um, and then freedom, uh, remote working and flexible hours, I think gives people quite a lot of freedom about when they choose to work. And, but you know, some people, they're early birds or they prefer to work in the evening. So I've got some people on my team who have very small children and working in the evening is the best time to work. And it's just about managing then um, when we talk to each other, um, which it, which we've worked out quite easily. Um, and, and also it gives time for side projects. And some of my colleagues have friends and family abroad, so they can they can work abroad and spend long more periods of time with their family and friends. So all nice things. Uh, and so one of my side projects was my first book, Contemporary Vernacular Design, which I, I couldn't have managed if I had a job in an office because it it meant I had to disappear for 10 days at a time doing um, interviews of householders and all the case studies. Um, and I um, fortunately, then I had one member of uh, my first team member at that point. So I used to go out and do interviews during the day and then um, load up work for her to carry on with the next day um, while I was away. So that that kind of worked. Um, uh, but it's not just me. So members of my team also work from abroad. And here are some of their photos from all over Europe. Um, and now I'm going to talk about work-life balance. So I think architects already have a huge number of hats to juggle <laughs> on the right-hand side. Um, and um, this is something the client doesn't see. Um, uh, uh, they just think, you know, we come up with a design as if by magic, but there's all these factors that we have to think about in the background. <clears throat> and then if you add a business owner hat to all of those hats, there's just way too many hats. So you have to delegate. You can't possibly do all of it, even though I have tried and failed um, many times. Um, so I think sometimes we just have to bear that in mind that we already have a very challenging job juggling many things and just, you know, give yourself a break on that front. Um, <clears throat> So it can be tricky um, having a really good work-life balance working from home as much as in an office because when you're in an office, you leave and there's that physical space that you associate with work, which is different from the physical space at home. So you can, you can, you can separate those things potentially more easily, although I'd say arguably these days with <coughs> technology, that's less easy because you can always be emailed at home. Um, so it's also about creating boundaries. So that, that's something I've done. <clears throat> it's been quite hard, but um, I never check email on a weekend because just one email from a client can ruin my entire weekend um, because I'm thinking about that instead of um, nice fun things that I want to do with my family and friends. So, um, And the, the reality is whatever the problem is, I can't solve it until Monday because the planners or the engineers or whatever don't open until Monday. So it's just such a load of stress that's completely pointless. I apply the same thing to evenings, so I don't look at it after six o'clock either. 
and that really helps um it's it's hard to do and you have to be really ruthless with yourself but it, it really works I, I think for the past two years I've managed to do it really effectively <laughs> and uh, I do feel a lot better as a result um and uh working from home I think it's quite important to have a routine because you don't have a commute and um some of that commuting I think is also about priming your brain so it's ready for work mode and if you don't have that you're literally moving from having your breakfast and your cup of coffee to your desk that's mm, not so great for your poor old brain so um I tend to uh, either go for a walk um listening to a cheerful podcast or um I do a thing called morning pages which was in the um Julia Cameron's book an artist's way uh, which is where you do you just start the day with rubbish rubbish writing whatever comes out and that's quite a fun way to get into the to separate the things as well and quite good for creativity too um and yeah I was talking about choosing your most productive hours so um I'm quite a sort of normal normal range um person I, I I'm more productive in the morning and then have a bit of a dip at lunchtime so I usually just go for a run or something at that point or a swim and then um I don't really click back in until about after three um <clears throat> so so that's when I do my I organize my day in that in that way so I do tricky stuff in the morning and then more creative stuff in the afternoon um <clears throat> and admin in the sleepy time but then other people on my team um are more late birds or early birds um night owls sorry and um uh so they just work those hours um, which suits them. And then we we just make sure we're all around in the middle of the day on Slack so that we can ask all our questions. And then we also make sure we turn off our notifications um, after our working hours. So if somebody's on there at night, um, which is their happy time, you don't want to be interrupted when, when you're in the middle of reading a book or something or whatever you're doing in your evening <coughs> with their work problems. So it's important to turn off the notifications as well. We, also, we all make sure we do that. Um, and then Cal Newport, in his um, he's written a few books, and one of them is Deep Work. Um, and he he writes about um, separating your tasks. So you have um, shallow tasks and uh, deep work tasks. And the deep work tasks are things that you really don't want to be interrupted in. So um, designing a house, um, any kind of um, sort of tricky problem solving sort of stuff. Um, allocate an hour or two to that and turn off everything and just literally do that and then um you make a list of your shallow tasks so things like emails and phone calls and um things that it doesn't matter that much if you get interrupted and if you split your day up like that you're much more effective in getting the work done and i say effective not efficient because i think you can become extremely efficient at answering emails very quickly but that's not being effective <laughs> that's not getting the crucial work done um uh, and tackling hard stuff early in the week, I, I often used to procrastinate stuff to the end of the week and then have a miserable Friday. <laughs> and so now I try really hard to really get on top of that um, on Monday. And then um, inevitably there are questions and things that trickle through the rest of the week, but the hard stuff is done and I know I can get it done by the end of the week then. Um, and creative breaks are my new name for... Um, exercise or any other kind of break like reading book or something because <clears throat> what I've discovered is that if I go for a walk then I have ideas that save me a hell of a lot of time sitting there staring at a screen anyway so the more often I do these creative breaks the less time <laughs> I actually have to work um, and uh, and I feel a lot better as a result but I've had to call them creative breaks so that my brain goes oh I'm not just having a dos I'm not just going for a walk or reading book or whatever um, it's actually fundamental to my creative brain to go and do those things. Um, I've spoken about boundaries already. Um, as a as a woman, I find it really helpful to plan stuff according to my cycle. So there are, there are high energy weeks and low energy weeks. And um, the low energy weeks are actually quite cool for um, reflection and really deep thinking. And um, they're quite good for learning as well. So I plan all that into there and... And then the high energy weeks, I put things like um, talks, like what I'm doing now, um, and you know, tricky client meetings. Um, any, uh, yeah, and all those um, 
if I want to get a load of working drawings done, that's a really good time to do it. And um, all the problem solving stuff. So instead of having it like I need to get everything done in this week, I do it more as I have to get everything done in this month. And this is how I'm going to organize that stuff. And the more you're, you get in tune with it, the more effective it is. And it, it's seriously like a hidden superpower because once you clock it, you're like, oh, life's so much easier when I'm not battling my hormones all the time. Um, so I'd really recommend that. Um, and then <clears throat> I think when you're working from home, particularly, it's really important to get out and about a lot. Um, so we do that. Um, as a team, we have our weekly meeting, but we also do uh, like that's a glass workshop that we did. Um, we have pub lunches sometimes. We cake often features. Um, uh, yeah, and we all do surveys. That's um, one of the things we take. I mean, we could outsource that definitely, but all of us enjoy it. And we learn a lot about the buildings as we're going around. And it stays in our memory much better than a load of photos does. Um, and increasingly, it gets us out and talking to each other and, and that kind of thing. So that's all good. And then site visits too. Um, yeah, and I also think work-life balance also comes from the business model. So if you have to rely on people doing overtime all the time to make the fees work, then it's not going to work. It, you just can't have an effective work-life balance in that way. And it's it's a real problem in the architecture industry not being able to get decent fees and competing with people who aren't qualified and they're, they're on them, they charge less. Um, but so the only way to get around that is to differentiate yourself in other ways. So the client isn't going, oh, that person's cheaper, but I can't see the difference. Um, you need to make sure they understand the difference. And um, so I found that niching... Um, which for us is in um, eco building, barn conversions and garden design. So it's like a triple niche. Um, I found that really helps because you're making it really clear that the client's in the right place. And so by the time I go around to visit them, they've already 90% decided that they're going to go ahead with us anyway because they've read all the stuff on the website and um, they're pretty sure we know what we're, we're doing and we're the right fit from a values perspective as well. Um, and then, of course, being an expert means you can charge higher fees because people want your expertise. They want it to go through the planners more quickly and um, have less problems along the way. Um, and then, so, but that means you can have more time off because you don't need to be chasing, you don't need to do the overtime, basically. Um, and then this time can be invested into better systems, which in turn leads to higher profits and so on. So, um, so it's all a lovely virtuous cycle once you once you can get it it can be really tricky to find your niche at first so um i say to people that um there's a diagram a japanese diagram called ikigai which is like three circles that overlap and the bit in the middle is is uh, the bit you should focus on so and in the circles uh, i can't remember exactly what they are but it's things you love things that people will pay you for um and skills you have and then the thing in the middle is the the gold and to be honest I've only discovered that recently but I I worked it out in a different way which was kind of like looking at my past experience plus things that I really enjoy doing like when I feel like my happiest and I could spend hours doing it and wouldn't care um, <clears throat> uh, um and then combined with skills uh and I came to the same thing so that's a way to do it um yeah remote and flexible working it it doesn't suit everybody. So um, you have to, I mean, and I would say we are in general, a gang of introverts <laughs> uh, who um, really enjoy being with people, but um, find it a bit overwhelming when it's all the time. So I, I enjoyed working in an over, um, in an open plan office, but I did find it stressful being interrupted regularly from other people around me on the phone or talking or, or whatever. Um, and I do really enjoy that thing that Cal Newport talks about, that deep work, getting really intensely into something, um, which you can only do if you have no interruptions, which is very tricky in an open plan office. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and But I like, I like both. I'm sort of somewhere in between. So I go out networking. I speak to clients quite a lot. Um, I make sure I have social activities outside of work to balance that. Um, and... Yeah, the weekly meeting went during COVID. Uh, so, yeah, we were well set up for remote working already. But the weekly meeting, which is normally in real life, had to go online. 
And um, it was okay for a bit, but over time we all just got depressed. We um, we really rely on that meeting for team morale and just comparing notes on things and um, sharing design ideas, which is much easier in person. Um, so I think um, I, I wouldn't advocate a completely remote working team. I think that weekly meeting is quite important. It makes us feel a lot happier. Um, and yeah, I've already said it's it's really great to work when suits you. So it's really handy for me now I've got a son um, and I wouldn't have been able to um, manage that otherwise. But um, even before that, I was really keen on triathlons and had lots of interest. So it's really nice to be able to just go for um, a bike ride on a sunny afternoon <laughs> rather than waiting for the weekend when it might be rainy. Um, and, you know, stuff like that is it's just fantastic. And writing my books, of course, I could do around um, flexible working hours. So no commute. Um, yeah, I've said all of that. Um, yeah, so when I set it up, I didn't know anybody else who was doing this, apart from there's a lady in... Um, in America uh, called Osha Wilson, who now works for Google. Um, but for quite a few years, she had a practice of 10 uh, called Boiled Architecture, and they worked all over the US and then came together for a big day once a week. Um, and that worked for her. And I thought, um, but I was already kind of doing it by then, and uh, but with a very small team. I think I had one or maybe three at that time. Um, and really, it came from my circumstances, which, which was I had too much work. I needed to take on somebody. I didn't actually want a team. I was a bit afraid of being a manager. I thought I wouldn't be very good at it but because um, I'm quite impatient. But um, uh, anyway, I was desperate. So I took on a student because I was teaching. So it was easy for me to find a student who was really good. And it worked really well. And um, but I realized that um, working those because I took her on part-time because she did it around her studies, I realised she's not going to want to commute to an office because I live uh, quite far out in, in um, the countryside. Um, she's not going to necessarily have a car. She's not going to want to come out just for that. So um, the weekly meeting happened because I was teaching at Brooks anyway and I could just tag that on the end of my day when I was already in Oxford and have a meeting with her. And then when I when she uh, went off travelling and lived in Australia for a bit, I replaced her with two people and we did exactly the same thing. So that's how it grew. It wasn't really from looking at anybody else. It's just uh, a practical solution to a problem. Um, and since then, I also found out Piers Taylor runs the same kind of thing. He does it with freelancers um, and he's been doing it for probably the same amount of time as me as well. Um, yeah, and so I wanted to talk about... Uh, how we think we have like our core team, which for us is nine people at the moment. And uh, so um, uh, eight architectural staff and one practice manager person. Um, and um, uh, But actually there's all these other people and all of these are on the business side. I'm not including the engineers and the um, ecologists and, you know, the, the other external consultants on the architecture side. And so actually... You think it's that, but actually you've got quite a big team to run, and that that's um, tricky. So it's going back to the you know the business hats and things again. So it's just um, sometimes just giving yourself a break about that, really. Um, yeah, and one of the things I like to do uh, to re-energize is um, work from the sea. Um, so and also the trouble with going to university is that all your friends are split up all over the country, and then. Um, after you have kids and weekends are very busy, it's really difficult to see them. Um, and that that's just sad <laughs> and, and a bit lonely. So I've worked out if I um, if I work on the train, I can uh, see them of an evening and maybe stay overnight, maybe not, and then just come back, work on the train again. So I get a full working day done and I get to see my friends depending on how far away they are. And some of them live by the sea which is quite nice too. So I'll often extend it a bit and call it a creative break, which works. It, really, it You know, I get to see my friends, which energises me and um, the sea. I love swimming in the sea. And the other thing I do is lots of gardening. Um, I spend a lot of time on my allotment, which is where I wrote my second book in the shed um, during the first lockdown, which was amazingly nice because I had a justified excuse to get out of um, the... Um, house and 
uh, it was really nice when Michael Gove said, oh, yeah, everybody should go on their allotment. That's a perfectly safe thing to do. I was like, yes, I'm already doing it anyway, but thank you for that validation because that, <laughs> that makes me feel better. Um, and, uh, yeah, and I already said, uh, it, uh, work, yeah, working from home enabled me to continue working around my son. So I, I took very little maternity leave, which I wouldn't recommend, but I had a business to run, a young team, and... Um, clients that really needed me at that time. So I couldn't take much time off anyway, um, but I was able to do that. And, and to be honest, sitting on the sofa breastfeeding, very boring. So I was quite pleased to have some work to occupy my brain as well without having to leave the house to do it. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, yeah, and these are other people working um, in a remote working way now. Um, so there's Pierce Taylor, uh, top right and bottom, yeah, top left, bottom right. And um, uh, Tara Bellade and uh, Lamre, uh, they run Bellade Studio. Um, they also have lots of remote workers um, and they come together for um, team events and things. Uh, and then there's Paul, um, bottom left, uh, Power Out of Restriction, which is a social enterprise they run alongside their other jobs. And they all do that remotely as well and then come together for their workshops and things. So um, it's growing. Uh, yeah, that's my book. I've finished. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Claire. That was fascinating. I mean, I, I, it was an interesting kind of delve into your life because it makes me think it seems almost that you've, you, you, you've reached such a balance that it's almost zen-like. I, I almost <laughs> inspire you with actually working with a, within an actual architectural environment, strangely. I mean, I know that my personal experience was really quite, I would say, gruelling. I think one gets used to it, but I think that having worked in offices for years, one just became accustomed to egos or to um, ridiculous working hours. It just became, you became normalised to it all. And I think, what was your previous experience? I mean, did you kind of have that experience of kind of working in, you know, slavishly in offices when you first graduated? Or is that why you decided to really consciously make this move to a very, you know, almost a polar opposite in, in a sense of, of how you decide to kind of live your life and, and work? I, I think for, for me, <coughs> freedom is such an important thing that I, I cultivated. It, I've worked in other practices, but I was always really um, rigid about leaving on time unless there was an important deadline, which happened about three times a year. It wasn't every night. And, and, um, and people just got to know me as being quite efficient within those working hours. Like I met all my deadlines so nobody could complain. <laughs> but I, I did feel guilty when I was leaving. There'd be the rest of my team still s sitting there. And um, so, you know, it was hard to do that, you know, the peer pressure of that. But I wanted a life outside of architecture. And I knew that I came in in the morning feeling really energised for whatever, I, you know, the triathlon training, whatever I'd done the evening before. So um, I knew it was worth it. Um, but it is hard. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting because, I mean, there was recently this enormous, well, I certainly, I was reading about it on Twitter more than anything else. But there was a big thing about, uh, I don't know if you ever watched it, but there was this kind of... Uh, a student um, uh, kind of a, a forum done at SIARC a few a couple of months ago, probably now, where three tutors were talking about basically telling one student gave a question saying, you know, how are we supposed to kind of work in an environment where we come over here, we're underpaid, we're underpaid enough, we're doing really long hours and, and still carrying on doing our education. And one of the tutors kind of remarkably said, and it really reinforces the kind of experience I had, which was basically suck it up. Um, you you will be underpaid, you're not qualified, you're of limited value to your company at that stage, you need to kind of do the, the hard graft in order to kind of prove your value. And I, it, it kind of went viral because, and I think actually two of the, two of the teachers actually got suspended for a period because I think it, it really touched on this idea that you know, as you're training, you are not a, you know, you're not a slave. And I think the way that you're, you're kind of like deciding to live your life, which is and, and have a work balance where you're saying trust people, you know, they can work remotely, but you just have to kind of give people, you know, don't micromanage. I mean, these are, you say it, it kind of slips off your tongue, but in fact, they're incredibly difficult for architects to do, don't you think? 
I suppose so, but I don't. Maybe maybe it's a natural thing. I just think if I've employed those people who, why would I employ people I don't trust? <laughs> and I just really value them. I think I think they're amazing people, and I um I deliberately employ them because they're better than me at certain things. So I just leave them to be better than me <laughs> at those things. It, um, and then um, trust that when they have problems, that they'll come to me because they do. Um, and, and that's worked really well for the past, uh, well, it's 11 years I've been running my practice now and um, eight that I've had a team of sorts. Um, yeah, so it, I, I it works. And that, that's also like from an employee's perspective, I've always it, it, um, really enjoyed it when I've been given a bit more freedom and autonomy and um, and overall being trusted by my employer. But um, it, yeah, it makes you feel um, valued. That's really important. I mean, I think it's really great that you've now got this kind of mini network, place like Ballade Studio, Paul Collective. I mean, Piers, I was, I was, you know, interesting before you hit that slide, I was like, oh my God, that's completely Piers Taylor's model. He's just getting, you know, taking freelancers on for, you know, for very slightly different because I think he's a bit more pick and choose, you know, which freelancers to use on a particular project. So it's not about really, um, you know, I sense more it's about, um, there's more contingency to it. He decides who he wants to work with for a particular in a particular place and that's it it's not about what i think you're doing which is a more holistic way of just building a team slowly over time in order to uh, uh one feel slightly more kind of um self-interested in a way than the other but i think that the 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 strategy itself i think is really interesting of what you're doing and, and knowing that you've actually got other teams of people who are doing what you're doing and kind of getting through their life so thank you very much indeed for your insight that's all right uh, I wish you the best of luck. Uh, I mean, it's just interesting that, you, that it seems to me that you didn't actually really make any big changes to your life as a result of COVID. And I think that that's a real kind of lesson for everybody, really, that your life was already doing this quite happily and nothing was enforced about it. So, Yeah, I mean, we still lost half our workload, like most architects, so that was <laughs> something else. But um, yeah, it, the remote working thing. Build it and it will come. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, Claire's book, uh, Design Your Life, uh, An Architect's Guide to... How, say it again, Claire? It's An Architect's Guide work to work life balance. balance. Is available from Reba Publishing. And if you do the very handily and very rememberable Pit All 20 on the code there at uh, Reba Books, you'll uh, get 20% off. So... Uh, we now move on to our next speaker, who is uh, one of our sponsor speakers, Jonathan Lowy, who's Operations Manager, Marketing Manager at BM Zinc. We'll be talking about Zinc in and around the workplace. Jonathan has worked with BM Zinc for 25 years in both technical and sales positions in three different countries. He understands market needs and possibilities for Zinc roofing and cladding, and also been involved in technical applications. BBA and fire testing. He writes technical literature for architects and installers and previously worked as a land surveyor in Paris, spending much time on its house manning and mansards. Um, I spoke with you earlier, uh, Jonathan, about the um, Maudlin uh, um, roof that I would actually want to see the latest issue of the RIBAJ if anybody's got it yet, uh, by Nar McLaughlin Architects. And fantastic uh, set of roofs there on top of each one of his 12 modules uh, and that looked like a very fascinating workplace to be in if you if you consider academic life as work but uh, maybe tell us a little more about that in your presentation I'm sure people would be interested but um, please go ahead thank thank you very much Carlos uh, and good morning everybody um, yeah that that is a very uh, interesting project um, uh, I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk on another day but I'm, I'm unfortunately not going to talk about uh, uh, Niall's project this morning um, just uh, uh, what Claire Nash said made me think about something because we quite often get asked the question where, where do you use zinc um, and as she had to find her niche we we have to find our niche as well uh, zinc is it's it's not going to be the, the cheapest it's not the most expensive material either but it is something where people uh, probably are looking for a certain aesthetic a certain durability a low maintenance 
uh, and that sort of thing. But it is used on a wide range of buildings, including offices in the workplace. Um, on the screen at the moment is a, is a project, actually a renovation project in Milan, in north of Italy, where um, zinc was used to, to reclad a building using this rain screen with a, a pigmento blue zinc. But I'll come on to that a little bit later. Um, just moving my slide forward. Um, uh, I don't seem to be... Oh, there we go. Um, so... Uh, <laughs> I always seem to mention Paris when I talk about zinc because it is a little bit our sort of ancestral home. Um, obviously, lots of types of buildings. Uh, in the foreground on the right is actually the uh, Prefecture de Police, the main police station. Um, just behind that is the uh, Saint-Chapelle, which is probably better known for the medieval stained glass windows. But it does have an awful lot of zinc uh, ornaments on it as well. Um, so... That view of Paris shows an awful lot of zinc. And the vast majority of that zinc is, is uh, natural, mill-finished zinc. Uh, but over the last uh, 40 or so years, we've developed a number of different uh, finishes. So you don't have to just have the, the mill-finished zinc. There's a number of um, colors we can, we can induce into the pre-weathering. Uh, it's always got a gray background. I always say it's a little bit like looking at a, a, a grey uh, zinc with tinted glasses. Whether those tinted glasses be green, red or blue or brown is, is your choice. But there's that discrete colour. So onto a specific project. This, this, is a, this is done a few years ago down by Cone Peterson Fox. It's the Witch Headquarters uh, just off the Marlebone Road next to Regent's Park. Uh, and it's a... Um, uh, a grade two listed Georgian terrace um, with actually a, uh, a 1980s concrete structure which was sort of bolted onto it as well. And uh, a lot of renovation was done on this building, including this roof terrace, uh, which was uh, raised up to create um, uh, breakout areas, conference areas, uh, a canteen, and actually a, a, an area for people to spend time, an open area on the roof terrace. And as you can see, it's got a, a pretty stunning geometry. Um, uh, Carlos talked about the uh, Nar McLaughlin project, the Morden College. Um, this does have a repetitive geometry, uh, but I would say it is, it is pretty complicated. This is the inside of it. So um, well, this is sort of obviously a breakout area. It has a sort of a multi-use. And uh, at the front, there's this um, terrace. You can see there the, the uh, anthrazinc standing seam fascia, uh, which is the same system as used on the roof. And the, um, the roof on the left sort of spills down onto the facade in an inner courtyard. And on the right, you can see all the... Um, quite complex detailing. We spent a lot of time with uh, Cone, Peters and Fox making sure that all those details uh, were correct, were weather tight, the valleys had the right slopes, the junctions would all work, uh, there wouldn't be any problems. And on the ridge, there's this sort of low profile um, detail ridge, which allows you to have uh, the, the ridge cap without sort of sitting up and looking like a, a chicken coop and something that's a little bit more discreet. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to play you a very short video, uh, which is really more designed, I've got to be honest, for installers, but it's only a couple of minutes, and it's just going to give you an idea of how zinc is folded, its characteristics, um, how it works. So if, if we could run that video, as I said, it's just a couple of minutes, and then we'll come back uh, after that. The G3 ridge is an elegant, low-profile ridge that can be used on both warm, non-vented roofs as well as cold, vented ones. The ridge kit consists of a ridge cap, a connector piece, compression strip and a colour-coded stainless steel clip. As with all zinc roofing, specialist skills and tools are required. For a vented roof, a 30mm opening is required and can be covered with an insect mesh. For a vented ridge, the top of the standing seam panel requires a 15mm upstand. For a warm roof, this can be 25mm. At the eave, a standard T-plate is installed with clips. The hem at the bottom of the panel will depend on the panel length. 
30mm for up to 7m panels and 50mm for panels up to 13m in length. For a dog tooth eave detail, the zinc should be punched. This eliminates the risk of any tearing of the zinc under high wind loading. A swept end eave is another option, but does take more time. At the ridge, the seams must be completely double seamed right up to the upstand. The ridge cap is placed over the ridge and the position for the clips is marked. The clips are then fitted with the bottom of the clip lining up with the mark. The compression strip is then fitted 10 mm below the upstand. The strip should be 20 mm wider than the zinc panel width. The ridge cap can now be fitted with the connector pieces. 2 mm should be left between ridge caps. A number of options are available for the junction between the ridge and the verge. Every clip must be attached to the ridge with a stainless steel screw. The protective film can now be removed. So, uh, hopefully that video just gave you a little bit of an idea of how Zinc's worked. Um, obviously, uh, it, it, that's aimed more at installers. It is important to point out that um, we do always recommend that a specialist contract is used and we have a VM Zinc at Work partner scheme uh, which allows installers to get a 50-year material warranty on the Zinc uh, if our design and installation recommendations are applied. Here's another job. This is the Promega headquarters, which was by PLB Architects. Um, it's on the um, University of Southampton uh, Science Campus. Uh, Again, um, not that complicated, but quite an effective geometry. Again, also using that uh, G3 um, ridge. It combines with uh, a lot of glazing on the, in the foreground on the left. There's a green roof. Um, uh, there you can see the, the glazing. And at the back of the, the building, there's some stone uh, that's, that combines with the pigmento red zinc, which is quite effective. And there you can see one of the interior spaces, um, which is uh, uh, fairly elegant. One of the, the, the interesting points about zinc is, and sometimes we get asked about how do we do the rainwater systems and the accessories, it's all the same material, so whether it be the gutter, the fascia, the soffits, the downpipes, uh, it's all the same zinc. Uh, there's no requirement to have another material. If the zinc uh, is used on the roof, um, all the accessories can also be from the same material. Not going to go into great deal about build-ups because that would really take too much time. But as far as roofing is concerned, we have two um, major families. On the right, you've got cold ventilated roofs, which is the traditional way of doing things. And on the left, warm non-ventilated roofs, which has a, a BBA certificate. Uh, both are absolutely possible. We quite often get asked the question, which one is better? It all depends on the project in question, really. Um, zinc is is a metal, so it's non-combustible, it's A1, and we've done B roof T4 tests concerning uh, flame uh, spread and penetration, so they're, there's, they're both, they both pass those tests. Now, zinc does uh, um, generally get used on the outside of the buildings, as you've seen, but on the left, there's an office, this is an office in, in Paris, an office sort of uh, entrance, a foyer, um, where, which has been clad in zinc, and on the right is actually a uh, an architect's uh, studio office in Beijing. So it, it does get used on the uh, inside of buildings. And here is uh, Adobe's headquarters in the US where zinc's going from the outside to the inside, pre-weathered quartz zinc, which is quite effective. And that gets used on a, on a number of projects as well. As we sort of started off, sort of why use zinc? Well, um, I suppose the, the key one is aesthetics from a design standpoint, but it does have a lifespan. Uh, there are projects which have been around for over 100 years, um, and the BRE indicates that. Uh, about 98.9% .9 of zinc is currently recycled in Paris. That's actually what's recycled. It's 100% recyclable, uh, but nearly all of it is recycled. Uh, it 
very little zinc goes into landfill. And as also as I touched on earlier, there are a number of finishes. It has a sort of a, a, a canvas of grey, but you can apply a little bit of colour. And that mixed with the uh, number of different techniques, whether it be standing seam or rain spring panels or flat lock panels, allowed a, a really large palette of uh, a sort of aesthetics to be created. Um, that's just been a very quick run through. So if you do want more information, um, CPD uh, samples, we'd be happy to sort that out for you. Just going to finish though, uh, again, um, obviously working from home or, or living at work. This is a project that was in the center of uh, France, which I think would allow a work life balance um, to, to work pretty well. Um, so with, you could uh, um, take advantage of, a, of an, a very nice space from a, a work point of view and also from a living point of view. So that's, that's it from me. I'm going to stop sharing and hand back to Carlos. Hello. Thank you very much indeed, Jonathan. Um, yeah, that last project looked like I could probably establish a good work-life balance there. Um, your Promega HQ, the Southampton one, actually was a subject of a PIP. The, PL, the PLB one was a subject of a PIP uh, seminar, probably three or four ago, actually. So it's nice to see that one pop up again. Uh, lovely looking project. Um, and thank you very much for your... Um, your two minute video, which actually generally marketing videos are kind of, you kind of expect a certain types. So actually to have some practical as even ridge details, along with compression strips, etc., uh, was actually rather nice to see. Um, so thank you very much indeed for that. Um, the other point about the unitary approach was also brilliant too. The idea, you know, drawing attention to the fact that, you know, both the roof surface, the ridge details, the soffits, and the drainage can all be the same material. And I think like works with that kind of contemporary look we have of kind of more minimalist material approaches. Thank you very much indeed for your time, Jonathan. Uh, I believe I now need to give people, um, oh, what's that? someone in the chat here is asking, question from Conway, are you working on projects in the Pacific Islands where high corrosive areas and cyclone wind loads of up to 72 meters per second to LS? Oh, metal clad material on offer is ultra color bond. Do you, do you want me to answer that, Carlos? If you can do it within the next minute. I'll do it within the next minute. Um, zinc, uh, as we started off saying, zinc's been used on lots of buildings uh, um, uh, and type building typologies. It's also been used on lots of places around the world. Uh, zinc's got a long, a long history of being used in all sorts of um, uh, parts of the world, uh, including uh, marine environments, including environments where there's uh, an awful lot of wind, hurricane zones, the, the Caribbean, uh, Reunion Island in the Indian, Indian Ocean. Um, so colour bond is, is painted steel, uh, but zinc can absolutely be used by the sea uh, where it gets very, very windy indeed. So that is uh, definitely uh, an option, yes. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and Conway, if you are on a Pacific island at the moment, I'm sure you've <laughs> established a very good work-life balance. <laughs> I'll, we need to, uh, we'll give everybody a 10 minute break now. Um, do remember everybody that we do have this wonderful thing called chat here and you can actually contact us directly and I can feed you any questions you have through to any of our speakers. Uh, it's 12 minutes to 10. I believe our, we will be talking again at uh, 10, 10 a.m. So um, you have 12 minutes to go off and get a coffee. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your attention. Hello, welcome back everyone. Uh, our next speakers today are Marika Lankit and McPherson, who are both associates at Priest Architects. And they're going to be talking to us about their mixed use scheme 135 and 155, I believe, Bishopsgate in the City of London. Marika is currently leading the refurbishment of this building. Uh, which is a 30-year-old building to create new public realm. She joined Fletcher Priest in 2007 and has had a diverse range of experience working on projects in the workplace, mixed-use, residential and cultural sectors. She's contributed to a broad range of projects, two large workplace and retail schemes in the city, 
and a number of prestigious projects uh, such as the Hackney Picture House and Pinewood Studios. Chris has uh, considerable involvement in major redevelopments and refurbishments with a notable wow. transformation at Broadgate where he is experienced in the design and delivery of projects. He's also got over a decade of experience at BIM to aid design visualization and coordination and has led coordination on a number of projects including Angel Court and here at 135 and 155 Bishopsgate. Uh, the project itself is a refurbishment that involved apparently the retaining of over 90% of an existing 1980s SOM design building, very postmodern if you haven't seen it yourselves, uh, to reduce the new design's carbon impact. It brought in offices in line with modern standards, improved thermal performance and air circulation in workspaces, and upgraded an outdated HVAC system with more efficient plant along the creation of new garden terraces that can be enjoyed by the tenants. It's also been shortlisted for a 2022 Reba London Award and was produced in collaboration with British Land. Um, Marika, Chris, uh, please go ahead. Good morning. Hello, good morning. Thanks, thanks very much for having us. How are you? Very well, thank you, very well. Good, good. Okay, so uh, as introduced, we, we're Flexion Priest Architects. Um, and we're, we're, for anyone who doesn't know uh, FPA, we, we are based in London and we cover a range of scales from, from urban design master planning through to architecture, interiors, and we also have design research in the house as well. Um, so my name is Chris, uh, and I'm one of the associates at, at Fletch Priest, and, and this is Mariah as, as introduced. Good morning. So we're going to talk about um, 135 and 155 Bishopsgate, um, which we have uh, recently re been refurbishing. Um, 135 was, was completed um, a couple of years ago now, and phase two of 155 um, is, is just nearing, nearing completion, but phase one was, was completed um, about six months ago. And um, just to give uh, a little bit of context to, to these buildings, so um, the, the buildings are uh, located in the city of London, um, in, in the heart of Broadgate, essentially. Uh, and, and they're adjacent to Liverpool Street Station, which I think we're told is something like the third busiest commuter rail station in the UK. So, so the footfall um, to the side of these buildings or, or along the front of these buildings is, is enormous. The buildings uh, were actually um, built to a Fletcher Priest master plan um, back in the, the 1980s, um, the, the buildings themselves designed by, by SOM. Um, and this is just a sketch of a, a mass, early massing sketch, um, which uh, John Robbins, uh, someone who still works for, for Fletcher Priest, um, did back, back in the 80s. Um, to, to complement the, the, the master plan as, as it was being um, progressed. So the building's made up of uh, essentially three entities, 135, 155 and 175. Um, so we were concentrating on both 135 and the 155 blocks um, and we are going to touch on 175 um, later on. Both 135 and 155 are, are owned uh, by, by British Land. Um, and we were commissioned in, in 2016 to, to start on 135. Essentially, the, the brief um, for, for the project was essentially to reposition what essentially was a, a banking fortress to attract a new mix of uh, workplace tenants. Um, and really our approach to this was retain and reuse as, as much as we could and um, optimise servicing within the building and create some targeted interventions to, to bring the, the building up to kind of modern modern spec. I think it's safe to say that we've managed to retain effectively 95% of the existing structure and fabric of the building. So we, we in, in terms of cladding, we, we replaced um, the level one and, and ground floor uh, cladding but the rest of the, the cladding effectively stayed, stayed as is. So it's, it's a great story in terms of uh, retain, retaining embodied carbon uh, with, within a building. 
Um, so today's focus uh, is a whistle stop tour of, of both buildings within essentially 15 minutes. Um, so we've got selected interventions that we'd like to discuss. So the first one is the Bishopsgate landscaping, followed by some uh, reception spaces, and then looking at uh, roof terraces, uh, with one in particular. So I'm going to briefly talk about the interventions we did um, in the Bishopsgate landscaping. So this is the situation as it used to look like when you exited Liverpool Street Station before the refurbishment took place. So very much as Chris alluded to, um, these were first designed as um, buildings for the financial industry back in the 80s. So very much of a fortress design, which was designed very much to keep uh, people out of the building rather than drawing them in. Um, so you can see these walls here and heavy bottle balustrading very much of its time, preventing views up onto the colonnade level where the office entrances and the retail are, and also really not inviting people to come up. So really what we set out to do here is um, flip that on its head and um, try to make this barrier as permeable as we could, removing the walls and the heavy bottle balustrading and introducing um, stairs to walk straight up onto the colonnade level, introducing seating stairs along the frontage, and then also adding um, little pocket parks um, and some much needed greening into this urban environment of Bishopsgate. Just to show you a few images of the before and after. So this is the 135 um, entrance as it used to look like before um, the refurbishment. So you can see the building signage here, 135, um, next to the entrance. But then there was actually no physical uh, way to getting up on the colonnade at that point. Um, so we really tried to uh, improve on that situation and create a big entrance portal with steps taking you straight up to the building, um, introducing seating step for, steps for people to pause, and then introducing the, the pocket parks along um, the colonnade increasing the public realm at this level. Um, so this is the colonnade level itself, with dated retail frontage, quite dark um, and uninviting at the time. Um, so um, after the refurbishment, um, the repositioning of the public realm and um, new retail facades on the lower levels have attracted um, tenants like Italy, and as you can see here, they are very much using these um, extended outside spaces for, for outdoor dining, and uh, it seems to be very popular and um, to be work working really well. Then looking in the other direction, this is the entrance of 155 Bishopsgate um, before the refurbishment took place, um, and then an image of today, um, which as you can see, we, where we've applied the same design principles throughout the frontages of both buildings with new seating steps, removing the barrier so that you can much more easily see what's happening on the colonnade level, and then also introducing pocket parks on the side. Okay, so focusing on the, the reception spaces, we'll cover both 135 and, and 155. But really, I think our approach to reception spaces is about trying to, to make these populated. So, I mean, traditionally, particularly in, in the city, the reception spaces are very, very sterile and very underused. So what we really wanted to, to, to introduce is, is, is a series of kind of coffee spaces, breakout spaces, and, and, and introduce high-quality materials to really pull people in uh, and, and use these spaces, not, not just as a, a kind of arrival space, but as an everyday everyday use. Um, these are some uh, before images um, of what was the Royal Bank of Scotland's um, reception space. Which, uh, it, was, it was quite a, a dark space, un, uninviting. Um, and on the right-hand side of the left-hand image here, we, we essentially introduced um, a whole series of glazed uh, cladding, removing the kind of dark frontage uh, to bring a lot more light in. Um, and we also look to retain um, items uh, which we thought were, were, were worthy of, of high quality. So on the left-hand image here at, at the back, you can see the sandstone arch. So that was one of the key items which we, we look to retain uh, in, in that space. The, the receptions are split both in 135 and 155 on, on split level between ground and first floor. Arriving at um, first floor reception via escalators, and um, this is the effectively se secure line of, of the Royal Bank of Scotland. Again, quite a very you know very um, sterile space, low ceilings, white walls, um, and really we wanted to to create 
a lot, a lot more of a vibrant space. So, so introducing um, a mix of natural stone uh, to the floors, reclaimed timber. We also stripped out the ceilings to expose the, the beautiful um, steel trusses and um, intermittently painting them, increasing the height um, and introducing this, this lovely concrete uh, feature reception desk in, into the space. Also introducing a um, feature wall with brass and stained oak veneer. Um, and on the right hand side, this is one of the, the ground floor images that, as you arrive. Uh, from Bishopsgate. And as you can see in the back here, there's the, the, the refurbished uh, sandstone stone arch uh, looking lovely within the space. We also wanted to introduce a lot more kind of greenery, so introducing the oxygenating planting um, and a reclaimed timber on, on the floor there um, for these kind of breakout spaces. Um, Fletch Priest also uh, designed um, some of the furniture, so the, the bonquette seating here. Um, and, and the tables were designed by, by us as well. Um, along the frontage, um, there's a, a new series of, of, of retail outlets introduced along Bishopsgate and, and Italy, um, which uh, took effectively 40,000 square foot of retail space um, in, in 135. We, we created a connection um, to, to, to Italy to, to allow people to, to penetrate through and, and we introduced a coffee kiosk to, to the left here um, to be used by, by everyone within, within the building, which eventually um, is being managed uh, by Italy itself. And on the 155 reception next door, we applied a lot of the same um, design principles. So this is the space as we first found it when we started working on the building. Um, so again, there were a lot of hard surfaces. Um, it, it felt very much as a space of its time and it was a, a tr transitional space so people would walk through it but not very many many people would pause in the space um, but then at the same time there were lots of things that were really great about the space and we really liked the theatrical quality of it the height of it um, and also lots of the existing materials that were used um, so when it first when these buildings were first built in the 80s um, SM um, specified travertine um, from, from Italy that you can see on the walls here and um, these incredible marble floors with the pattern that was designed bespoke for the building and there was a lot of timber panelling and, and brass details so we felt really wanted to retain a lot of these these good things that were in the building but at the same time felt the need to, to bring this into, um, into modern days and make it more attractive to um, a new range of occupiers. So really, this is the kind of material pattern we then looked at, um, complementing the high value materials that were already there, um, but also trying to soften the existing um, experience of the space. So again, this is what it looked like before um, the refurbishment, and then the same view after the intervention. Um, so some of the key aspects here are um, the introduction of a central bar. We felt that the space very much needed some focal, um, central focus point um, to in invite people to, to pause and to stay in the space. Um, we introduced a chandelier above, which we felt made this um, space even feel more theatrical, together with some soft furnishing and, and soft um, curtains throughout. Um, we did treat the marble flooring um, and acid at the surface so that it became much matter. And we actually feel that was incredible, incredibly successful in turning it from, it from a glossy 80s um, surface into a much more contemporary finish. And we're really, really happy we kept that and, and we feel it works really well. Um, and of course, this all is to do with bringing people back into the workspace, especially post-COVID. What can the workspace offer to people? people um, that they don't find at home. Um, so Bridgeland are telling us that this coffee bar is, is very much used a lot um, and people are using these spaces as informal breakout spaces and, and meeting spaces. And on, on the level one reception, similar to, to 135 Bishop's Gate, it's, it's very different because we've got less daylight and the floor to ceiling height isn't as generous as on, on level one. So we felt we needed to be a bit more radical here, there, here in our approach. So we didn't um, keep the dark and dated marble flooring in this instance, but we managed to retain almost all of the timber paneling 
um, just giving it a, um, some new paint. Um, then we added some light marble stone tiles to lift the space and also to complement the existing marble floor on the ground level. And then we introduced seating niches with the same mesh bedding that we used for the chandelier downstairs. So this um, uh, reception only opened a couple of weeks ago. Both receptions are open to the public. So if you're in the area, please go and have a look. Um, so just moving on to uh, roof terraces. Um, so we've, we've managed to introduce at least uh, four uh, new roof terraces across uh, 125 and 155. And we, we did this generally through the consolidation of older plants and making things more efficient. So on the right hand side here, this is a level eight uh, where we consolidated the, the full wrap plant, plant space in front and, and the newer plant is, is sitting behind the camera here. This is level 10 um, where we wanted to create um, a, a kind of roof garden um, complementing the, the reception spaces below and um, for, for all of the, the tenants to use within the building. So once we've removed uh, the plant structure, uh, sorry, the plant um, itself, we, we actually will look to re re retain the steel plant structure. So we repurposed this uh, and effectively created a, a forest on top of, on top of the building. Um, where we planted 40 silver birch trees, which is a, a fairly unique space within, within the city of London. And this is complemented by introducing uh, a business lounge as well. Um, and we've got parasol lighting um, to, to the ceiling, which, which allows the space to, to feel like it's got natural light coming in from above as well. But I think this is a really successful, successful and a unique space within the city for the occupiers to, to use. Just very briefly touching on completing the block. Um, so as Chris already um, mentioned earlier, the third building in this row is 175 Bishopsgate, which in the future will be known as One Exchange Square um, because it is facing onto Exchange Square on the other elevation. Um, if you've recently been, um, the park has just been refurbished by a DHDSA into this incredibly lush um, green space. Um, highly recommend to see it if you haven't yet. It opened in January. And um, so we are very much still at the early stages at the moment, but this is what we're hoping the building will look like in 2025. So as you can see, this is a much more um, significant intervention we're proposing here, mostly to do with the um, um, changing the envelope. So we're replacing quite a bit of the cladding, refurbishing other parts of the cladding and introducing triple glazing throughout um, with the aim of keeping the operational carbon very low. Uh, with a target of five-star neighbors rating. Um, you might have seen this published in the UK Green Building um, Council's case study, which came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, and then very much in the same vein as the other two building, um, buildings, we're retaining a lot of the existing structure, which we can do because of the really good bolts these buildings have. So it's incredible um, floor to ceiling heights and the beautiful trusses that we, we saw before that we're also planning to expose here. So again, just looking at the steel that we're retaining in one exchange square will be um, half, the equivalent of half of the material used in the Eiffel Tower, which we always find surprising because these buildings aren't particularly tall, but they're just very um, big floor plates. Um, and then equally um, looking at the concrete, this is the sheer amount of concrete we will be saving by not building the building from scratch. So retaining all of the, the slabs, um, but then also the foundations which go through Liverpool Street Station and beyond. Um, so this is the, the advantage of being uh, working with refurbished buildings that we really enjoy as a company to, to bring the best out of the building stock um, in, the, in, in London. Um, I think that's it for today from our side. Um, are there any questions? Thank you very much indeed, Mike and Chris. Um, I've got some questions. Um, I, what I found really intriguing about that project and your description of it, because I mean, it is a very, very overbearing project, always has been, and I was kind of interested in how you were going to kind of um, deal with it at those lower levels because they are extremely challenging. As you say, it was a kind of a banking fortress. And what strikes me about it, even despite your intervention, is how unbelievably um, overpowering that original architecture is. That in your pre and post iterations at ground level, the 
even though you've eaten into it in a way and kind of scabbled away at that kind of solid base. I mean, how challenging did you find it to kind of have to work with? Because it strikes me that the architecture is just unignorable. But you, you have to kind of work around it rather than kind of, get, you know, get under the skin of it. How, how did you find it as a process to deal with? I think probably interestingly, when you walk past the buildings, especially if you walk past the pavement, um, right next to the buildings, you actually don't see a lot of the buildings. So a lot of the elevations we were showing are not real elevations because that's never how you perceive the buildings. So in a way, we think as a pedestrian walking past the site, the ground levels are the ones that are, have got the most impact on the public realm. And we felt that those needed the most intervention and we were able to do those within our brief, really. Yeah, because those galleries, I mean, it's, it's completely true. They were wholly underused. I never re really used to think, apart from the people using the building, I thought, who the hell uses it? it? It was kind of fake public space. And I see how far you've gone to try and break down that mm -hmm. galleria street. You know, you, there is no longer, you know, what you're trying to do is kind of break, but it, it's just such an enormous building. It, it, it Was it a huge challenge for you to kind of manage? Yeah, it was it was a it was a huge challenge, and, and I think one of the actually one of the key challenges that, apart from the architecture was the interface with network rail. Um, we the high voltage rooms below um, the, the the walkway are connected with network rail, so there was there was an incredible amount of um, um, uh, work done done with them to, to accommodate this. I find your. Um interventions at 135 and 155 really interesting not so not just about how you made the changes but how different those changes are between the two buildings i mean the 155 one strikes me as uh, i mean the 135 one strikes me as that kind of you know 80 kind of AT&T, philip johnson lights you know there was this kind of sense of trying to kind of provide the effort but not having that kind of ultimately, you know, the, the kind of scale he could work at when on the AT&T building, but a very similar kind of feeling. Um, and I think it's really interesting how you've kind of cherry picked what you thought was the best of it and have kind of tried to, to kind of break down the scale and kind of make those spaces feel more um, usable. And I, I think it's even more interesting on 155 because I think you've kind of gone from, from just that kind of really solid 80s POMO solidity creating mm. a kind of, I wrote down here, Carlo Molino, epic and intimate. But there is something about that, that he both takes the idea of travertine marble, kind of rich, heavy materials, and then counterpoints it with curtains and meshes and gauzes and mirrors and kind of creates these really lovely theatrical effects. And I think it's actually kind of, it's it's completely regenerated what the space is. And I think it's actually quite impressive what you've done because I, you know, for me, the idea of the architecture is just it's so heavy that you any intervention you do seem to be working in spite of the building rather than than with it. And I think you've really done with both those entrance areas, I think you've really worked to the to the strengths of the space and done something that's completely reinvented it. Thank you. Thank you yeah, no, no, we, we, we're very pleased with the results as well. Yeah. We think it's interesting, especially because you wouldn't design buildings this way these days, because no client would spend the money, or at least not uh, on this building for in, within the brief, or on the travertine walls, the marble flooring, these very generous volumes as well, where you cut out a lot of the usable NIA effectively. So, so yeah. we felt really lucky to be able to work with those, those great um, designs to bounce off, really. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I mean, I'd like to know what's happening on the first floor. I mean, we only saw the visualization of it, but the idea of, it's funny because I looking at it, I thought you were taking up, I thought you'd take up the or keep the marble floor as you had done on the lower level. And you'd kind of do something with the timber on the sides. And actually you took the completely different idea. It was like, let's just change the floor altogether. And you know, instead let's just paint on the timber and kind of and it it, it does look to me from the visualizations that it causes a really fundamental change to how you perceive that space. It's a shame we couldn't see a finished photo of it. <laughs> so you were just breaking off. What was the last question? Sorry. I was just interesting when we might see photographs of that first floor space because oh. I'm very intrigued about how it how those visualizations kind of come through to reality. Um, well, we're just we're just finishing off in the next kind of month or so, um, and we'll be organising professional photography. So I, I'd say within a, the next couple of months, we'll, we'll be able to reveal that it is it is actually open at at, at the moment, and 
we're, we're finishing off some some other some other areas. So anyone that walks past can can, can pop their head and talk to look if they're interested. Um, we've just got a question here. Sarah's saying silver birch trees introduced on the roof. Was the structural strategy to facilitate the tree? And were services and plants rerouted? Well, I think it was more about you freed up space due to more efficient plant, really, wasn't it? Wasn't that? It is essential, yeah. I mean, everything developed over, over the course of, of, of the project. Um, and, you know, finding that we could consolidate the, the plant after looking at the servicing strategy. And um, so once we've managed to consolidate that, then there was a thinking, well, we can reuse this this piece of structure and, and reuse, it, reuse it to our advantage. Um, which is which is where we, we managed to you know have the discussions with the structural engineers and and, and find out that we can we could accommodate 40, 40 trees on, on the roof but it was really driven by that that planter uh, sorry the, the plant structure itself and being able to to accommodate the weight of, of that soil and, and the trees. It seems to have generated a completely different space type space at that upper level, which I think is, must be great for the people who are actually using the building. Um, you can actually hear the birds when you're up there, and you can yeah. hear the wind rustling in the leaves. Really yeah, great. no, I'm sure it, it is. I, I'm sure it's, it, it makes a fundamental difference. I can't imagine. I mean, also at the lower level, I mean, the idea that you've kind of, I mean, I'm assuming those ground, those lower levels, they were, there were some retail units there, but it was pretty much on that, on the, on the um, gallery, yeah. it was pretty much just kind of, it was, it was individual, small, smaller retail units. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, one, three, five. Having having Italy come in and take forty thousand square foot on on double level and um, is is incredible, and it yeah. it's incredibly busy down there. And then along one five five, we've introduced black sheep coffee, which are supporting the cafe bar space adjacent, and um, we have nests. Um, and a couple of other retailers as well, and um, so high, high quality retail in there now as well, which which really helps. And, and if you go uh, uh, Broadgate, the British Lands Broadgate Vision was was effectively to, to transform this from a five day week um, area into a seven day week because you know you used to go down there years ago, and you know during Saturday Sundays it, it wasn't particularly busy. Now when you go down on a Saturday. Italy and along along Bishopsgate, it's absolutely packed with people. Yeah, well, I mean, that was all part of the bigger Peter Reese kind of megalomaniac city, yeah. wasn't it? Um, one more question quickly. Uh, Sarah saying triple glazing, the introduction of triple glazing, did this reduce the existing services offering? Well, I'm assuming that the existing services could be reduced anyway. Um, yeah. And so this, is for one this is for 175, yeah. So yeah, and are you able to share the future cost effectiveness of specifying triple glazing? Okay, so um, just briefly, because we're only at the early stages of the design process here. Um, so yes, we will um, be changing the uh, entire servicing uh, to the building, so it's all new plant effectively. And because we are introducing triple glazing, um, we will need less of it, um, of course. And in terms of the cost of triple glazing, I would have to refer to the quantity surveyor, but I, it was actually not as bad as we saw it in terms of percentage compared to, to double glazing. Um, so I guess it, it depends very much on what a particular spec you go with, but um, uh, we definitely felt it was the right thing to do for this building, uh, mainly to do with um, keeping the uh, sorry the operation, the carbon low, um, and achieving our target of five stars uh, neighbor rating. Yeah, Terry Vanner here is, is not so happy with what you've done on the exchange square side of it, I have to say. He said, I preferred, I thought it was a pity that it has been changed. But I mean, the real decision around that was actually about just making it a more a sustainable building in every way and actually pulling more light in as you say they're very deep floor plates aren't they mm. and it's very interesting when you look at the existing cladding we did an audit of every single piece of the cladding when we started working on these and although lots of it was built to a high quality most of the components are at the end of their service line so they're not performing very well anymore and they're starting to fail so really lots of it unfortunately isn't salvageable if we want to extend the, the life of the building and make it a much more sustainable proposition well, thank you very much indeed, Marek and Chris, for um, showing us your, yes, actually turning something that was kind of over the top and postmodern into actually something quite theatrical in its own way, but but definitely theatrical for the 2000s. Um, very interesting approach to, to uh, managing a building, and as you say, and actually keeping its carbon footprint low in terms of its refurbishment. Thank you very much indeed for your time.
Thanks great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice speaking to you. Um, our next speaker today is Amma Assad, who's a director at Tigray Yeoman Architects. Um, BGY were actually guests on a recent PIP sustainability webinar on Eccleston Yard in Belgravia, a refit of a redundant Victorian industrial workspace to create a new destination and public space. Here, I was talking about uh, their, pro their project Department W, uh, which is the Beaux Arts facade of the Wickham's department store on the Mile End Road, which basically was a building built in, in I don't know, early, I suppose, early 20th century with a jeweler named Spiegelhalter refusing to move when the store was planned. So it was basically built around his shop. And reading around it has just um, introduced to me the concept of what they call on their website the Spiegelhalter void, which sounds like some kind of like psychotherapy term, but I'm sure you'll tell us more about it, Emma. It sounds like a fascinating project. Um, are you there? Yes, hello. Let Good me, to meet uh, you. I look forward to hearing about it. Thank you. Uh, it's not working. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Amr Assad and I'm a director of Buckley Gray Yeoman Architects. And today I want to give you a short presentation about the Palm W a mixed-use scheme we recently completed for Schroders, which includes office space, retail space, gym, etc. Department W, though, is more than a building. It is, in fact, a bit of a myth. It is in itself a David Goliath story, which has got a huge amount of richness in its background, which we've looked to bring into our development. The site itself is located on the Mile End Road, and it sits very proudly. It's 100,000 square foot of development, which has got a rich history, but has recently been very much unloved. It was, as you rightly say, completed in the late 1920s. And when it was completed, it had a really grand ambition to be the Harrods of the East. It was originally conceived as a department store, competing with Selfridges and the like, with the idea that the grand neoclassical architecture would be something to really bring people into East London and draw the crowds in the same way that the West London comp competition had done. And as the Wickhams, the Wickhams being the, the owners of the, of the department store, as they developed their site, they went about acquiring the plot that would create this um, establishment by buying a number of um, separate terrace houses and terrace buildings that ran across the Mile End Road. They started off by buying all the terraces on the west side and they got to this middle section here, the Spiegelhalter unit. He did not sell. It was a set of jewelers, a family of jewelers, and they decided not to sell up against the progressing sort of acquirement of um, the Quickens. Then they moved on to the east side and they started buying all of the development on the east. Still, the speaker holders did not sell. And that idea of the holdout, the speaker holders holding out, remained throughout. The Wickhams continued to buy the land and acquire their site, but the speaker holders remained in situ and did not sell. And in fact, that idea of the Kind of Dave Goliath story, the Wickhams and the, and the Spiegelhalters remaining side by side, remained all the way through to the 1980s. And only then did it become under one ownership. The department store, although successful uh, early on, later failed and became a set of offices and um, retail units. And Spiegelhalter later closed down. And so when we came to the project back in 2017, what we were met with was a development which was very beautiful, but very much unloved. You can see the neoclassical facade remaining and very proud, but very much um, uncared for. Retail units 
again, not made, made best use of. And the speaker halter unit actually stopped becoming a shop, stopped becoming a building format at, at all, and only remained as a floating facade. And internally too, you can see that the kind of the piecemeal nature of the of the development of the years and the way that the, the building had been uh, sort of progressively deteriorated. It was very clear to see this is the back of the speaker hot units as we found it, and these are the various spaces internally. So when approaching the site, our brief was to really reinvigorate the, the building and try to bring it back to its former glory and create a really truly interesting and expressive office space. And what we did is we, we took out David Goliath's story and we wanted to make David win, make David win and do that by creating a very simple but precise intervention whereby we wanted to put the new reception, the new heart, the new vertical circulation of the development into the Spiegel Holzer Void, meaning that everyone who was going to use the building on all of the upper floors had to do so by entering through fire the Spiegel Holzer Void, removing what was once the uh, historic main entrance to the development through the main entrance here and moving it into Speaker Halter adjacent. That created a sense of interest, but also gave us the opportunity to create a very legible and singular way of moving up and through the building. You can see here the early model showing how the Speaker Halter facade remained in this state. And that idea of walking through the history became part of the daily routine. On the ground floor, it shows here the plan, how the new lift core, the new vertical circulation and the new reception was accessed via the new entrance on, um, underneath the speed halter void. And that provided access to various auditorium and the like. Again, a few images showing this idea of the sequence, the entry, to see how the speed of halter void became an important entry point and something which announced the history and heritage of the building as you ran through the entrance and into the reception. Here you can see the kinds of grain. And what we tried to do is everything was left as honest and legible as possible. The new intervention being a modern and contemporary look and feel against the very rough um, existing architecture that was there. If you're looking back at this, speak of the void. That gave access, obviously, to the main reception of the, of the development and the other amenity that came directly off the ground floor space, be it auditorium, meeting rooms, etc. But more than that, what the location of the new vertical circulation did is it gave the opportunity for that story to be part of the daily experience of users as people walk through the building onto various floors, as you exit the lifts, as you exit the staircase, you'll be met by this kind of David Goliath story and all of the grain history that comes with that. So if you move up into first floor, having accomplished this idea of this singular legible circulation in the middle of the building now, we're able to refurbish the entirety of the office floor plates. And in much the same way that we did with the speaker halter void, we wanted the design to be honest, legible, and really almost defurbish all of the work that had been done over the last few decades to really bring the, the character of the building to the fore and create office space which is contemporary, which is desirable, but which really plays on the history of the building. And that also extends to the work that we did externally, again, cleaning the facades, replacing all of the windows with like-for-like um, crystal star windows and providing upgraded performance, but also upgraded um, depth here. Moving up onto the second floor, again, you can see how the, the space had been much improved by means of the new circulation intervention. Again, moments that occur in the building where we uncovered old um, skylights and so on were really brought to the fore. You can see the transformation from what it was when we found it. 
Moving up to the top and final floor, you can see here again what the intervention provided was the opportunity to really create a link, and open up what was very much a segregated top floor, a floor that was separate to um, the, the previous main circulation and the one that was only accessed by its own um, stair core. And when we found the top floor space, much like the rest of the building, it was really uncared for, very much um, unloved and in a state of disrepair. And what we have to do is, as I mentioned previously, very much defurbish this space, bring it back to life and find any moments of character and how that would work alongside the new interventions. That's something that we found real joy in. And actually the spaces that we found, the old built, the old manager's room, the old safe, the old um, fireplaces, all of that was brought to the front. And you can see here again, an overview of how that building, how the top floor reads, the new interventions allowing light to come into the space, really create a sense of volume and life. And as you'd expect, where the opportunity occurred, we looked to provide um, outdoor amenity, and other moments for joy, again, looking very much back at taking cues from the past. And so in doing so, what we were able to do was create a building very much of our time, something which tenants desired and something which was a, a real, um, really unique offer in uh, regards to the office space that was provided. And something which a building which enjoys a, a series of moments, a series of real uh, flavors, if you like, across the building, which plays on the uh, history of the building, but also provides a modernity, which is very much of our time. It's worth saying that the building was let in entirety to Queen Mary University, and it is currently being used by their officers. With that said, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hammer. That was intriguing. Um, I was actually going to ask you because I was wondering who, my first question was really about really the nature of tenure because I was just wondering who actually ended up taking that building because obviously it must have been designed pre-pandemic and I was thinking what happened really? Were there any changes really on the client side to actually maybe creating different kinds of spaces or breaking the space up differently in order to deal with the fact that people aren't kind of moving on mass back into their offices but clearly with a single tenant like QM, uh, QMU you're not really, don't, didn't ever need to deal with that eventuality. Well when we designed the space we, um, we you know we designed it on spec, thinking that it could be used by any number of uh, tenants. The ground floor space that I showed images of very much looked to provide a number of inbuilt amenity features. We provided meeting rooms, auditorium spaces, um, a cafe, obviously the reception, and all of the other um, outdoor amenity spaces with that too. Anticipating that you know the, the it could be used by one tenant, many tenants, co-working, you know, the flexibility was there. But in all instances, what we wanted to do was create a, a building which was as much open to the public as it was open to the tenants. And so those amenity points that I mentioned, the auditoria, the cafe, etc., are all accessed directly off Mile End Road. But funny enough, now, although the building is completely let to Queen Mary University, the ground floor spaces are open in that way. And so anybody can come off the street, use the cafe, use the amenity that, were, that was designed to be semi-public. And it really does become a, a sense, of, uh, sense of joy, a sense of, you know, uh, part of the public realm effectively. So no, I think it worked out very well in terms of that, that kind of um, combination. Hmm. I think it's very interesting how you um, delve, you know, because for me, I kind of suppose, because it had been a jewellery shop, I suppose my initial thing would be like, you know, go spangly because, you know, you're picking up on the history of the old <laughs> shop, blah, blah. You actually very consciously resisted all of that and you actually took for, went for a very pared back, minimalist, um, it almost looks like a kind of Tunion architects, you know, a very kind of, you know, almost very Spanish, um, I'm just saying kind of like using brick with aluminium and kind of putting putting materials together in very pared back ways. What drove that? Because why didn't you just think, oh, it's a jeweler shop, why don't we go nuts? 
Well, I think you know there was obviously you know we we explored ideas of how, you know how how much we dialed up the kind of the decorative nature or how much we harked back to the 1920s um, architecture of old, but we quickly took the decision that any intervention that we put into the building was one that was explicitly of our time, explicitly modern, and one which um, we'd like to hope was another le level of urban layering. The building had obviously, you know, started off very much in a kind of piecemeal fashion. The owners acquiring sites around Spiegelhalter, Spiegelhalter then came into play. And then, you know, over time, the top floors have been chopped and changed. And what we wanted is our intervention to be almost the latest piece. And one which hopefully in years to come will be added to again by another architect, another team, another client, something which, you know, hopefully reads as a moment in time. And, and that, for that reason, we want it to be almost explicitly so. I think it's also good, I mean, how well you kind of use the length of the plan, because it actually looked like a very, very deep plan, and you just seem to have cut it in the right way, so that you just keep pulling light in. Any available opportunities for you to draw in light at lower levels, you kind of took them. And I think that probably was, you know, that obviously required some kind of efforts from your, or some commitment from your clients, because obviously, you know, I'm sure they want to just maximise their floor space, yet you made very conscious decisions to kind of pull back where you could and draw light in, certainly at the back of the building, from the sides. And, you know, certainly by the time you get to the roof and you've got that lovely kind of glazed roofing area, it's, it's really, it looks to me like there seems to be an awful lot of ways of bringing light into that building as you move through it. And I think that kind of helps building this narrative as you walk up. Oh, completely. And, you know, it's, not, uh, it's light, it's volume, but it's also character. You know, areas where we felt features should be made part of the experience, part of the journey, part of the day-to-day -day experience of the building are things which are really fought for to, to ensure that actually, although they might have, might have, you know, lost NIA or, you know, removed some sort of um, aspect of area gain or whatever, yeah, yeah. but we felt that the experience, this is something which we very much fought to do. And uh, we think it's, you know, for the, for the, for the betterment of the building at large. We've got a couple of uh, comments from people. Uh, Sarah says, thank you, Amma, the project is heartwarming, accepts nostalgia, creating spaces for contemplation in the midst of work and interactions in a positive way. Good to see that the Spiegelhalter building has been respected. And E.C. Brown says, such a beautiful build, oh, such beautiful clear open areas, the building now really allows the user to also appreciate the outside scenery. It's so lovely. I mean, it has been, it, was it difficult kind of managing the, because obviously you were revealing at the time of going through the process. I mean, how easy was it for you to kind of like program it ultimately? Because then it sounds to me like there was a certain amount of kind of guessing, you know, as you were pulling things out, what was being revealed ultimately. So were there any problems in terms of how you, how was this building procured ultimately? What contracts were you using? Was it DMB or? It was DMB. Um, I just wonder whether things got turned up, you know, in the process of pulling the building out. Well, completely, it was, it was completely a forensic exercise. You know, we had to go and really explore the layers that had, that had sort of built up over many, many decades. You know, the building was designed originally as a department store. So the way the building, the circulation of the, of the building um, from, you know, from the offset was one which was sort of counter to what you expect in office development. The way that the depth of the, of the floor plates, the ceiling heights, the ME strategy, all of that had to be looked at um, carefully to ensure that what we provided was one that was contemporary, which sort of appealed to the modern tenants, but one which respected the history. You know, we were keen not to create a kind of homogenous white box, but something that just very much played with the history of the building and the kind of character that, that we found. Um, a lot of the um, areas and the features that, we, that we've shown, the image that you have presented here on your, on your PIP uh, message board was, um, you know, it was uncovered in the, in the strip hub. You know, we found areas where um, features had been uh, covered up by plasterboard, ceilings, walls, uh, light wells, all of that was uncovered in the, in the strip out and enabling works. And, you know, we very much had to 
had to work with the contractor and with the clients to ensure that those areas were uh, were revealed and made the most of. Well, Terry Vanner says it's good to see the Spiegel Bald Halter building has been respected. And Conway, if you're there over in the New York Pacific Island, said, well articulated presentation. I'm a love the David and Goliath pool from detail planning where the journey begins and ends like the Trojan horse. Safe door refurbishment. <coughs> great. I mean, I have to thank you very much for your presentation. We have to draw it to a close, but what a gift to have a, uh, a project like that with such a, a kind of wonderful story, as, as everyone's picked up on. Your presentation of it is extremely evocative, purely through the strength of that whole idea of David and Goliath. And that is a purely architectural, um, a fundamental architectural understanding of a project, which in fact leads to a whole, you know, a whole bundle of joy as a result of that thought about kind of making David the winner at the end of the whole process. And um, it must have been a lovely project to work on. And thank you very much indeed for having spent the time to present it. No, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, just one more thing. They made a change to the um, to the actual area itself. That's what I wanted to ask. Actually, one final question was just how the community have responded to it. Well, I think you know, a town like Queen Mary University is very much sort of part of uh, my land, part of yeah, the whole yeah. area, and uh, you know, having them as the main tenant was hugely welcomed. And as I said, the the way that they've taken the space is very much about being outward looking, you know, trying to bring the community in on the ground floor, the you know, the cafe use, the Victoria, all of that is open to the public. And the way the um speak of the halter void has been designed is one that anybody can walk in, anybody can enjoy the space. That is effectively an extension of the streetscape and something which everyone can enjoy. So I think it has been uh you know hugely welcomed. And I think as well, you know, people are very uh very sort of proud and, and love the story. And I think everyone was very um, heartened to see that that was became, that became respected and become part of the architecture often. Oh, well, thank you very much indeed for your um, application in the project. It, it, it's really produced a wonderful result. I think it's really nice. Great for the, great for the street too. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, our next presenter is Joey Wilkinson, who's a solutions consultant at PlanRadar UK. Uh, he's been working there to embrace digital transformation at the company and with 10 years experience in technology solutions and primary focus within architecture and construction, Joey helps AEC businesses rise and thrive with collaboration through digitization. Uh, the company also obviously seems to be doing quite well there, Joey, because as we as we saw at the beginning, you're uh, talking from your offices over there on the absolutely lovely. I was gonna say, yeah. Hello, yes, I'm just trying to get my camera on. Um, sorry, it's the first time using uh, Zoom in quite some time. Just bear with me two seconds. That's a there. surprise. Yeah, we're a, we're a Teams company through and through. Here we go. Hello, Joey. Hello, am I coming through clear now? You are, yeah. Apologies for that. Um, yes, oh, you're, so I, I, you're so high up. <laughs> so we're on floor 25 of the shards. Yes, we moved here relatively recently. Um, but yes, thank you for the introduction there, Carlos. And uh, also thank you to Amir as well. Um, some really beautiful spaces that you're creating there with uh, with Buckley Gray. Um, so yes, my name's Joey Wilkinson. I'm a solutions consultant at Plan Radar, and I'm here to talk through the future of buildings and uh, where digitization plays an important role to help get us there. So me personally, I've got about 10 years experience in digital solutions with a primary focus on helping AEC businesses to digitally transform. So as a solutions consultant with Plan Radar, we're helping architecture and construction organizations across the world to really embrace digitization uh, using our platform. So for the session that I'm going to go through today, I'm going to talk through some of the changes and trends that Plan Radar are seeing from our perspective on the office and work and space environments and how digitization is playing an important role in the future of buildings. Uh, and hopefully at this time, I'll, I'll take you through a quick demo on how the solution with Plan Radar is doing this now. So these are some of the customers and partners who are already actively using Plan Radar from around the world. Um, just a quick disclaimer for those of you that may not be too aware of um, who Plan Radar are. We are a software platform and it allows you to fully digitize and centralize all of your projects. So that includes the drawings, the models, but then using these as the reference point to build and capture your own customized workflows 
and processes on site as well as link together your communication and documentation so everything is centralized on the one platform and that way when one person makes a change it's reflected across all the teams who need to see it um, which I'm going to be showing you in a, uh, in a little while. But this new way of building is dramatically improving collaboration between the design, build and management teams. And it's significantly improving efficiency, uh, saving each individual user about seven hours a week, uh, reducing miscommunication and mistakes, really helping you finish your projects on time and on budget. So these are the, some of the customers that are already actively using Plan Radar on their projects. No doubt you'll see some familiar faces here. Um, ATP using us for a lot of their projects currently. They've highly recommended Plan Radar to construction and architecture business on all projects. Uh, Arup are doing a Plan Radar global rollout for big projects in fire safety. Uh, Morgan Sindel, Third Way, obviously again creating amazing spaces for the clients in the office and workplace sector. And they're using Plan Radar for a lot of these modern office projects. So there's Plan Radar being used in action on the right hand side. And through the partnerships that were, I was talking about there, we've seen some significant changes across the industry over the years. Um, here's a few of them worthwhile mentioning. Obviously, the new safety regime uh, for the construction industry triggered by Grenfell. Uh, described as the biggest change in biz building safety for over a generation. Um, we've got architects who are set to assume the new role of principal designer, for which core competency principles are being defined in the emerging BSI 8671 framework. Um, and then obviously digitization, that's a, a, a bit biased, but may as well be talking about that as well. Um, really important one to mention that the construction industry as a whole is the second slowest industry to move forward with digital transformation, um, right above hunting and agriculture. In fact, I believe there was a time earlier this year where hunting and agriculture were beating us um, and we were back of the pack. So um, construction is the only industry that doesn't have platforms in place to provide the golden thread of information, the single source of truth, allowing all data, processes and documentation to be built and archived in the one platform. The engineering side, I have got this covered. You know, if a plane was to fall out the sky, engineers are able to trace back the cause of that to the single screw um, because they are managing the data and information correctly. Construction still very much working from pen and paper or manual based methods, causing problems with information and communication. But we are on the crest of a wave here. Plan Radar are seeing more and more businesses embrace digitization, which is helping office and site teams to collaborate with agility, dramatically increasing efficiency and reducing mistakes. On the architecture trend side of things, again, some of the things that we're seeing uh, on the left-hand side there, net zero and building reuse is a big one. Um, our customer Arup have a, have a good example of this with their project on Eight Bishopsgate, uh, just down the road from uh, the project Fletcher Priest Architects uh, alluded to earlier. Um, Arup have minimized material use, they've optimized operational efficiency, and they've created collaborative alignment between the design and the engineering teams to reduce carbon cost and improve building usability. Um, examples of post-pandemic office and hotel spaces transformations. Um, a good one to think of is the Western Williamson and Partners who laid out ideas for social distance in workplaces. So that's, you know, transparent screens around the workstation, baristas, hands-free doors, all components to let staff return to the office safely. Uh, biophilia, the human instinct to uh, desire to connect with nature and other living beings, uh, and biophilic design that creates an atmospheric space that encompasses this concept. Uh, Maggie Center in Leeds is a good example of this, which features timberline space surrounded by healing green light environments, soft lighting, natural tactile materials. And we're constantly seeing more and more sustainable materials being used in really clever ways. Uh, bamboo concrete, biochar, which is the, the, the waste product produced when trees are burnt, uh, potato chip board, 3D printed graphene, um, and care bricks, which are bricks that are 90% recycled construction and demolition waste. So some really clever things happening on the, um, on the construction materials. And essentially, workspaces are changing um, dramatically. So from the size of the space available for each person, 50 square feet per person, to the actual designs and flexibility of the space. So uh, demand for flexible uh, office spaces is up 37% in the first six months of 2021. 
There are currently over 6,000 flexible office spaces in the UK and flexible space accounts for more than 85 million square feet of UK office market. In fact, new co-working office spaces uh, opens up once every five days just in London alone. And to get there really depends on the, your ability to future-proof your, your buildings. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to circle back to Plan Radar a little bit here. Um, there's been much talk around the BSB and in particular the creation of the golden thread of information, as mentioned before, which is in essence a common data environment of all data related to your buildings, the design, maintenance, material use and processes, which includes a tamper-free record of who made what decision when, including the element of uh, accountability and transparency, particularly when stock change, uh, changes hands. And this is exactly what Plan Radar provides. It's a single platform that centralizes every single one of these components when traveling to sites. No, you no longer need to take along sketches, voice recorders, cameras, pens, and papers anymore. It's all done through Plan Radar. And ultimately, technology just makes things simpler. Um, we give you simple, intuitive tools to the people on site and the office teams, uh, which ensures proper on the ground visibility and accountability, creating a simple way to record every event in a building's life cycle, what was done, where it was done, who did it, when it was done, how it looked before, after, and so on. And really just making sure that we've got the right people at the right time with the right information. Um, ATB Group, one of our architecture customers, they say that they've been able to reduce the time spent on defect management by 50%. Um, the collaboration between their um, design and site teams is better more than ever. They're getting more done in less time by ensuring the right people have the right information. And they've said, in essence, there can be no first class buildings without efficient construction. And there is no efficient construction without efficient construction documentation. And this is what uh, architects are using uh, Plan Radar for. Um, as Claire mentioned in the beginning, architects wear many different hats and they need to be mindful of many different components uh, that the client just doesn't see. So that, uh, these are some of the main reasons why architects are using the Plan Radar platform to reduce that workload. They can share annotate and compare different plan versions and BIM models from any device. You've got easy project tracking, smooth report generating, centralized project data and communication, which allows design and site teams to collaborate with a transparent overview of your project and processes. Uh, the solution gives simple, intuitive tools to the architects, engineers and site teams. The architect can manage, compare and annotate drawings whilst collaborating with the on-site teams who will then have the tools to ensure proper on-the-ground visibility and accountability. So the solution is really streamlining the whole process. And on the site teams, as it says here, um, they, they have full visibility of everything uh, that have been given by the architects. And then whilst working on site, they can tag things, capture information, add their images, videos and voice recordings and export reports in about 10 seconds. All in all, Plan Radar has dramatically improved the overall quality and efficiency of construction projects from conception to creation and beyond. It's saving each individual user about seven hours a week per person with a return on investment of up to 900%. Now, there's a couple of clients that I wanted to quickly run through um, that we're working with, but I am a little bit conscious of time. Um, you can see more about these on our website, obviously ATP, Big Architecture, um, organization that are working with ourselves and thirdware as well. But what I quite like to do with the, the remaining time that I have left is just quickly show you what this looks like in action. So I'm on my iPad currently. This is one of the devices that either the guys on site can be using or the architects in the office. Um, all the data is centralized. So any changes that we make will be reflected for everyone. From the architects, what you'll be doing is uploading your plans or models into the platform adding pins to the plan, and then you've got multiple different forms that you create and customize yourself. We work with you to make these as bespoke as possible. And architects are using this to um, annotate drawings. They can um, take screenshots of the plan and annotate them. So they can draw on them, add stickers and text. And you've got unlimited cloud storage, so you're getting as many of these uploaded as possible. You get these assigned out to whoever needs to see it. You can CC your clients into it and then give due dates and a task 
uh, outstanding at that point. So any information you want to get in there, you can. You can compare plan versions at any time and have a full audit history of all your plans available. And our system is actually comparing the plans against each other and it's highlighting in red right there where the differences are. And that's happening in real time across all devices using the app. And then on the construction side of things, if we go back over to one of the other plans that we've got here, again, organized by different projects that we've got. They're walking around on site, they're adding pins, and using these pins, they're capturing information for multiple different processes, QAs, snagging, defects, fire safety, health and safety, the list goes on. And all they're doing is inputting the information, prioritizing it, assigning it out to the, the team, CCing clients, inputting as much or as little information as they need and opening up this job. You've got an overview of all the tasks that are currently outstanding to the left there. So you can see what the current status is for each individual task. The people working on these can update these in real time. So get the information in there, update the status, add their own photos and videos. And we've also got a log at the end there that records all changes. And then this information can then be exported at any time. Choose what you want to get exported, filter it out, put it into a customized report template. That takes about 10 seconds to generate, which will look something like this. Again, fully customizable. Choose how these look for client purposes or internal purposes. And all we're doing is exporting the information from those pins into that report that you've dictated beforehand. And the process takes about 10 seconds. All the data is built up in Plan Radar. You can download that at any time. You've got unlimited cloud storage, unlimited projects, and you've really got the platform here to have the golden thread of information, full audit history, um, and that's going to be reducing your, your workload dramatically and improving collaboration across site teams and office teams. And I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover. Um, if anyone's got any questions there, the slide that I'll leave here, uh, my number and details are at the bottom left there. Feel free to reach out if you want to look into this. But yeah, feel free to ask any questions now while I'm here, if anyone has any. Uh, thanks a lot, Joey. Um, I'm obviously a really little person because when you said I've got my iPad here, I, I saw the iPad and I actually thought, gosh, you've got a very steady hand there. But <laughs> your hand. Um, yes, I was just wondering, I, it, I suppose I minded more about, because, you know, I think about things, you know, constantly about the whole, the, the whole, um, seminar in, uh, as one thing. I remember I was kind of minded to think about accessibility issues, mainly because that kind of triggered when I suddenly started thinking about Fletcher Priest and, and about how they would have managed accessibility issues to deal with coming up to that boulevard level. I was just kind of interested. Um, do you find that accessibility is more of an issue? I mean, are you finding architects are actually requiring this of you about how, how to better manage dealing with accessibility issues in buildings and how is that done with, under with Pan Radar? Definitely. So right now, the way that the collaboration works, um, it, it can be a little bit all over the place with different platforms, different processes, and that ultimately leads to, to miscommunication or misunderstanding. Um, with uh, the single platform being used across the design and the build phases and onto management, all the information is being built centrally. So as that's being updated in real time, that's reflected across for everyone. So that's again, that's reducing the chance of miscommunication and misunderstanding. And because you've got the transparency here to see everything that's going on, when you're assigning tasks out, you've got the information at your fingertips immediately. Um, so it's uh, it, it's really helping with the accessibility. The, the app itself is, is free uh, well, to download. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about accessibility in terms of say, disabled egress and and being able to move around buildings. I'm just wondering whether it's been oh, I see. we're asking that more particularly about having particular, you know, pins that they could use, which are talking about ensuring those issues are properly incorporated into their designs. Definitely. So um, working off the, the, the plan or the model essentially helps things click a bit more when working around on site. So it gives them that reference point. 
um, they're able to, to walk around with their, their iPads or their phones, the app's free to download across all devices. Um, so using the plan, using GPS tagging, they're able to really illustrate what they're up to, capture the information and take photos and videos of the issues on site. So that's reflected for everyone. And without people needing to come to site to review the current status, they can review that using the project management components, using the images and videos that the, the, the people on site have attached. Okay, well, it all looks very, um, very kind of easy to use and kind of user friendly in terms of printouts and stuff. I mean, what's it cost an architect? I mean, you know, I see you've got lots of big there, but we're talking about, you know, a lot of our, our um, membership are kind of, you know, one man bands working in the backs of their houses and the back extension. So is there, you know, do you have kind of costing tiers or how do you, how is that yeah. done? So just to, just to give an indication of cost on, on, on this platform, it generally works out about 1,400 for an in-house user. So that's someone that would need the full functionality. Um, so that's 1,400 for the full year for that one user. Everyone else is free. So if, you've, if you're assigning jobs out to subcontractors, if you want to keep your clients in the loop and provide transparency, they are completely free to get set up with an account. Okay. The, um, the, the return on investment there, you're saving about seven hours a week per person. Add that across all your users, times that by the year and their, 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 their wage, you're generally getting quite a dramatic return on investment for, the, for, for what this thing costs. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, I mean, you know, I suppose really, you know, using virtual platforms is kind of where we're going with our workflows anyway, that people are doing remotely and are kind of auditing, you know, using tools which they're then sending on to other people. So that idea of kind of not necessarily needing to be together when information is collated and then transferred, I suppose is really part of where we're going in our in our lives generally. Um, thank you very much indeed for your time, Joey. Thank you. Um, well, we are just about on time. I think I'm two minutes over. I can hardly believe it. I'm usually going well over at this point. Um, it just uh, remains for me to thank all our guest speakers and sponsors, uh, without whose input and support the PIP webinar series wouldn't be a series at all. Uh, so thanks to Claire Nash, Director of Claire Nash Architecture, Jonathan Lowy of VM Zinc, Marika Lankish and Chris McPherson of Fletcher Priest, Amir Assad of Buckley Gray Yeoman Architects, and Joey Wilkinson of Plan Radar, who just seems, who's uh, just been speaking. Uh, and remember, in participating in these online webinar series, uh, that you're actually living out the transitioning from old modes of working to new. Perhaps the furlough system has proved, as Claire kind of, you know, preempted in a way, has proved that individuals, perhaps we no longer need to work, but just be paid by our governments to consume. Perhaps Saatchi and Saatchi's Labour isn't working slogan might be viewed less as a campaign winning slogan for Thatcherism and more as a prophetic understanding of a future society where work as a concept, where uh, work as a concept, excuse the pun, has become in a sense redundant. And on that note, uh, I look forward to seeing you at our next PIP webinar, where I hope you'll be fully engaged rather than redundant. Uh, it's on the 16th of June and it will be on design for health and well-being. And uh, thank you very much indeed for attending today. I look forward to seeing you next month.